All right, everyone, thank you so much for coming today. Um, our wonderful speaker is a dear friend of mine, Seth Rotberg. Um, he is actually the co-founder and board president of our Odyssey, um, and he has Huntington's disease. So let me tell you just a little bit about him um, from his wonderful bio and not me as his friend. So Seth Aww. is actually a motivational speaker. Um, he is a community connector and rare disease advocate. He was passionate about using his personal experience to support the health community. His passion is driven by his mother's 17 year battle with the rare genetic disease known as Huntington's disease. At the age of 20, Seth also tested positive for the disease and is a gene carrier. Throughout the lifelong odyssey of overcoming this adversity, he came to understand something profound about the meaning of life. Now he dedicates his life to helping others along their odyssey of facing adversity or roadblocks in life. Seth is a nonprofit leader with 10 plus years of experience in patient advocacy within the rare disease space. He has a successful track record of public speaking and community engagement, including a talk at TEDx Natic. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. He has a master's in nonprofit management from DePaul and currently resides in that hasn't been updated, but he resides in Chicago. Oh boy. Um, the one I have says uh, Massachusetts, which is incorrect. Um, so anyway, Seth is going to be talking about grief and loss today. Um, I'll, just as my own touch about Seth, Seth is great. He is a super awesome advocate. Um, and I am so looking forward to you all hearing from him. So with that being said, take it away, Seth. Thank you. And when you hear your bio out loud, you're kind of like, oh, maybe I should change it up a little bit. I feel like I was like, oh, I felt like when you said like, profound meaning of life I just thought of the circle of life the lion king maybe it just me I don't know <laughs> but anyways thank you again Anna for the introduction and for those uh, who joined today so I'm going to share a little bit about grief and loss but also just not about perhaps losing someone who has passed away but also just those own experiences of dealing with grief in a variety of ways. So for me, you know, I had to deal with uh, grief and loss, not just with my mom getting sick, but also just losing out on perhaps a what people may call a quote unquote normal childhood. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about my own experience. Uh, what's important is knowing what type of support and resources that you'll need going through some challenges you might face in life. So I'll share a little bit about some of the support and resources that have helped me talk a little bit about the grief and loss stages. Again, I'm not a grief and loss expert. I'm just here to share my own experience. So, you know, the hope is that we can have a good conversation afterwards to further discuss this and identify just any ways that we can even support one another. So I'll talk for about, I know Anna said 20 minutes, you know, might be maybe closer to 15, we shall see, but then we'll dive deeper into the conversation. So let's kind of get started. So I want to kind of take you guys back to kind of talk a little bit more about my Huntington's disease odyssey, no pun intended, but taking you back to uh, 2005 when it kind of all started. And that's when my family and I noticed that my mom was kind of acting different. Uh, that's when she was officially actually diagnosed with Huntington's disease, which I will refer to as HD. And what was challenging was that the years prior, she was misdiagnosed. As we know in the rare disease space, misdiagnosis can take quite a long time. We were told that she had bipolar disorder, and major depression because of her mood swings where one moment her and I are having a normal conversation suddenly we're in an argument over something little she's upset or frustrated or just simply depressed uh, due to the motor symptoms of Huntington's disease it caused her to have poor balance wobbly movements slurred speech so these kind of drunk like movements and so it was definitely challenging once learning about this diagnosis because you know, with Huntington's disease, it slowly, slowly progresses over 10 to 20 years. There's no cure. And all I could do is kind of watch my mom slowly get worse and worse, where I kind of just had to sit there and try to figure out what does that mean for me? And how do I kind of process this? And so when my parents sat me down to tell me about this news, I think we're all trying to process this. 
So we turned to Dr. Google, which is, is a good thing, but not so good thing, right? Because you get the answers, but then it's also quite scary because I started going off in my head of what symptoms my mom had that were shown on Google. So depression, mood swings, clumsiness, loss of energy and motivation, the list goes on. And what also stood out was that, you know, that 10 to 20 year lifespan that she had, because my mom dealt with it for about 17 years of my life. She passed away about six years ago. And so dealing with it for most of my life, I'm 30 now, you know, I dealt with it for what, since 15 years old, it was, it was quite a lot. And to be perfectly honest, I felt isolated. I felt like I was definitely in that denial stage of grief and loss where I didn't want to accept it because I was trying to, I was a 15 year old and I remember just being in high school and trying to just fit in with my peers. And unfortunately my friends, although they were great and they were supportive, they didn't understand what I was going through. And I think that was something that was very challenging. And I'm, I, I, I believe maybe some of you might be able to relate to is that, you know, when you're dealing with any type of, you know, rare chronic condition, you're trying to see who else understands you. And that's how I felt throughout most of my high school is I, I didn't have that support that I wish I had that I could have used to process that my mom was dealing with this incurable condition. There's no cure. And more importantly, I had to kind of take on additional responsibilities at home. I'd have to take my mom out for errands. I just had to grow up a lot faster than my peers. And, you know, to be honest, it was because my mom was, was, you know, sick and not considered normal, like my friend's parents. And so I felt like I was trying to, you know, relate my life to them. And I kept trying to say, well, how, how can I have that sense of normalcy? So I would stay after school, pick up work, stay out playing basketball, going to friends places, just to kind of feel that sense of normalcy again, because the other challenge that I faced was, you know, being out in public with my mom or having friends over and feeling kind of embarrassed only because people would give these weird stares. They wouldn't understand. I would feel judged. And so these were a lot of emotions that I was trying to deal with throughout my, you know, teenage years. And then from there, you know, I learned that I had a 50, 50 chance of inheriting this disease. And so I thought, well, maybe I should go through genetic testing. And I decided to go through that at the age of 20, as mentioned earlier, uh, when Anna was introducing myself, it was such a tough a personal decision to make. And for me, it was so I could plan my future accordingly. So I could plan to figure out, you know, romantic relationships, kids, career path, financial sustainability. And I just didn't want to live with the unknown. Um, now, what was challenging about that, and this is kind of where that grief and loss piece of it comes into play is that you know, when learning that I tested positive for it, knowing how much it would impact my future, knowing that I was destined to slowly deteriorate both physically and mentally, just like my mom was, was something that in the back of my mind, I thought, well, if I have it, I have it. But once I heard from the neurologist that I tested positive for it, my mindset kind of shifted. And what I mean by that is as soon as I heard that news, I was already thinking, who do I tell? And how much time do I have left? How much time until I'm going to show symptoms? I was trying to plan my future. And in fact, you know, I went back to college that after getting my results, pretending like nothing happened. I pretend, I just kid you not. I remember I went out that night, went to a party, still trying to process this all. And I will say that may not be the best way to process some big news like that. But for me, that was kind of where I was at because I was not only kind of trying to process it and trying to feel like it's going to be accepted as a part of my life for the rest of my life. I, you know, I was kind of angry about it. I was also kind of sad, had these mixed emotions. And I think, you know, looking back, one, that's okay to have these emotions, especially when learning about something 
as, as big as uh, uh, receiving a diagnosis for a rare chronic condition. But also for me, you know, I just, I just didn't take time to process it. And that's something I wish I did more of was process all of these things rather than trying, especially as a guy, trying to be the strong one and trying to say, hey, it's okay. I'm going to be okay. And everyone else is going to be okay because I need to put on a show to say, hey, I'm, I'm this big, strong guy I'm, um, that doesn't show emotions when in fact I do. And I've learned that, especially over the last few years, especially last year, you know, with everything going on with the pandemic, you know, of the importance of showing emotions, the importance of being vulnerable and the importance of just, you know, being true to yourself. You know, the other part that kind of shifted my mindset a little bit was, you know, the grief of losing a friend. So a good friend of mine, uh, his name's Jake. He, uh, you know, unfortunately passed away. It was the day before my la or our last semester of senior year in college. And it was, you know, an unfortunate uh, accident that happened. But what was so challenging was that I wasn't ready to accept that I was, because, you know, I lost him too soon. I lost him unexpectedly. I didn't understand why I was kind of, again, going through that grieving piece. But I think what I realized is that, you know, for me, I was able to be become more understanding of the importance of, of grieving the loss of a friend, the loss of someone that you care about, you know, with, even with my mom, I had to grieve twice. Um, once was when learning about her diagnosis and then the other time when she actually passed. So to me, it was kind of like, I lost my mom twice in some sense, um, because she didn't, you know, as she got worse with her condition, both physically and mentally, you know, I had to try to adjust to this new normal and it's not an easy thing to do. And I'm going to share later on, you know, the resources and support that has helped me during these different kind of experiences that I faced, whether it's again, losing a friend like Jake or losing out on my childhood memories or losing out on potential future memories that I might, might lose out on because of Huntington's disease. So what I do wanna share is a few of the lessons that I've learned from this whole experience. Uh, one of the biggest things was I can't compare myself to others. I felt like I kept trying to compare myself to my friends and, and my friends who either A, didn't ha have a parent who might've been impacted by a rare chronic condition or the other one is living with a health condition themselves. And I felt like I always had to compare myself to others. And that caused me a lot of emotions because I would always put more pressure on myself. And that's kind of the, the second one, which is just being true to yourself. I've always put pressure on myself and it's to one, try to be the best person I can, but also try to, I was trying to be someone that society wanted me to, to be. And that's something that I think is important when trying to deal with your own grief is you have to, you know, take that step back. And that's exactly what I did was take a step back and say, you know what, I can try to be everything to everyone. I can try to, you know, be this amazing person that you see on, that you might see on social media, but in the back end, the back end, the background, right? I'm just as similar as everyone here as anyone else that's, li that's living with a rare chronic condition. And that's okay. And I've learned that I've learned to try to accept that, that I'm going to be true to myself because that's what makes me who I am. It doesn't define me. Uh, you know, this Huntington's disease does not define me. Um, but more importantly, I feel like I, I actually define that because I'm able to not just only share my story, but share the other parts of me that go beyond Huntington's disease. And so the last part is and I had to put this in because it reminds me of my girl Brene Brown is it's okay not to be okay you know I mentioned before you know I had to essentially grieve for 17 years of my mom battling Huntington's disease as well as when she passed and you know knowing that grieving is not and I re will repeat is not a sign of weakness and that it is okay not to be okay 
and I've become more vulnerable. It's still a work in progress, but I've been trying to be more honest with my feelings. You know, last year I dealt with a lot of anxiety, a lot. Honestly, this was rescheduled because of my anxiety, because of my mental health. And it was a challenge because I didn't ever had the experience where I had to reschedule doing a talk like this. But, you know, after talking with my support system, including, you know, talking with Anna about this, like, we realized I had to do it because I needed to take care of myself. I needed to be able to understand the importance of just taking care of myself and understanding that it just wasn't a good time. And what I learned from that is that it takes time to grieve. You know, I could have been dealing with anxiety for a variety of reasons. It could have, you know, part of it was just, I had to deal with my own mental health. The other part was learning about Huntington's disease, racing against this invisible clock of when am I going to start showing symptoms? And the other part is just, for me is, is just, I don't know. I think it's just important to take that step back and reflect a little bit. That's what I did a lot of last year is just to reflect on, on what I needed to get by during some challenging parts in my life. And so you know, some of the things that did help me that I just wanted to share with all of you are, you know, what I call, probably could have called this my resource and support, but I think some of you might be able to relate to some of these. So for me, it was one of the biggest things when dealing with any type of grief for me that helped was finding a mental health specialist, such as a therapist. I was able to finally find one. I will say it's very tough. We could probably have a whole nother conversation on the challenges of finding a ther therapist, especially one that takes your insurance or that's affordable. Um, but that was something I definitely uh, did. I'm, I really appreciate it. But what I've also learned from that is when I learned about my mom's diagnosis 15 years ago at the age of 15 and tried going to therapy, I wasn't ready to go, but I also wasn't finding the right therapist. And what I mean by that is I was looking for just any therapist that could help me. I was looking for one that could listen to me. And a lot of them were just so interested in my mom and learning about Huntington's disease that it just never worked out. And in fact, I was very resistant to go back until um, probably about four years ago when I realized why not give it another shot and find the right fit for me. And so that's been part of helping me look at my my past and looking at the child and looking at all the the you know, grief I had to go through and how can I now learn from that to then make a better tomorrow. Uh, the other ones, right, is connecting with a social worker, right? And that's, you know, somewhat similar resource as a therapist. It is different, but, you know, another great resource that I've been able to find and identify. Uh, friends and family, I think, you know, the big thing is the importance of opening up and being vulnerable, sharing your thoughts with them, Tell, you know, telling them how you feel. For me, I was always hes hesitant, not just because I wanted to try to be the strong one, but I didn't want to feel like a burden. I didn't want people to, I, I was assuming that people would say, oh, Seth, this is too much. I can't deal with this. When in fact, when I started opening up, even last year, I remember I told one friend and he kind of just, you know, took him a sec and he said, you know what, thank you for sharing. I appreciate, because he asked, the whole how are you and I was like you know what actually let me tell you how I'm doing and I think it just made me feel so much better that I didn't have to say the typical oh, I'm good how are you but like explain that I was struggling and hearing him say oh you know let me know if you ever need to chat reminded me of the importance of, of that support system and understanding that that they can be there no matter what other one connecting with others in your community or what I call or through your our odyssey family that has helped me a lot. Um, you know, I always talk about the story of first person outside of my own Huntington's disease community that I met that was a young adult was Anna. And like when we first hopped on a call, you know, two different conditions, but we were able to relate on these unmet needs that young adults face. And I think that allowed us, I'll speak for myself, it allowed me to feel more comfortable, to open up, to not feel judged. And it really helped me, you know, know that I wasn't alone. And I think that's so important is whether it's your own kind of disease specific community or our odyssey, just knowing that 
here's an additional kind of resource for you. Journaling your thoughts and meditation that could go hand in hand depending on um, you know, what your comfort level is. I'll, I'll be honest, both of those I never thought I would be doing. Journaling I really enjoyed because you just get, get pen to paper or even if you type it on your computer, just getting those thoughts out I think is so important. I'm an overthinker. I overthink everything. And so if I can write it down a little bit and then try to play out the whole role besides playing it out in my head, I feel a lot better. And then the meditation piece, I just put a few, few that I know of. There's a lot out there. Um, but meditation for me, I thought I had to do it for 30 minutes to an hour. I do it five to 10 minutes a day. And that honestly has been a game changer. It made me just kind of open up the mind, take that time out of each day for me. And so, you know, these are just some of the resources and support that help me as I continue to grieve. It's not a, I would say it's not something that suddenly, at least from my experience, like goes away. I wish it was like, all right, cool. You're done. Your grief and loss stages are over. It's not like that. Um, so just kind of, I think, just remind yourself, what are your resources and support? Who's going to kind of be there for you, whether it's that peer to peer support, that professional support. And then are there other additional resources, whether it's journaling, meditation, um, anything else that you think is going to help you along your kind of grief and loss process. The last thing before we get into discussion, and again, I'm not a grief and loss expert, but the five stages of grief and loss, just want to go over them real quick. I know some uh, I've, I've seen that there, sometimes there's seven stages depend, depending on who you ask. So, uh, bear with me. I'm not, I'm not here to say hey, this is the right way. This is the wrong way, but I just wanted to quickly go over them. So that first stage denial, right. As I mentioned to you, when I learned about my mom's diagnosis of Huntington's disease, I was definitely in denial. Didn't want to accept it. I did not, you know, I, I became numb and, understanding, okay, why did this happen to my family? Why did, and then when I tested, why did this happen to me? Next one, anger, right? Then I started getting angry. My emotions started building up. I said, well, this stinks. And honestly, I, I did, I took it out on my mom and it wasn't because she was a bad person. I was just so angry that this disease was going to take her away from me. And that was challenging years later because I had so much guilt inside of me that I was trying to make up lost time to, to really make it up to her as well as the community in general. And so I learned a lot about this whole <laughs> angry side of things. I'll be honest, when I was in high school, I was a very, very, very angry child because I just didn't know how to deal with any of it. So some people might say, is that true? I said, yes, it is, it is true. I'm, I'm an, I can be an angry person. <laughs> the next one, bargaining. Um, this one, I'm going to be perfectly honest, trying to figure out a good example, but it's kind of just like, you know, to me, from my understanding of it is, uh, you know, during grief, you feel vulnerable, helpless, and in those moments of like intense emotions, it's not uncommon to try to regain control um, or want to feel like you can af affect the outcome of the event. So for me, it was kind of like trying to regain control of my life, dealing with Huntington's disease, dealing with even just the loss of a friend or loss of those childhood memories and trying to figure out what is that, what does that entail? It's kind of like, I kept saying, what if this happened? What if I didn't test? Right. And I never tested. Well, I probably wouldn't be talking about this right now, but to me, it's sometimes always that's kind of the, the place that I go through sometimes is the what if or if only statements. Depression, another, you know, fourth stage per se. And just keep in mind with these stages, they aren't always and it's not always saying, oh, OK, I go denial. OK, then I'm done. Then anger, then done. You can actually go back and forth with, with each of them. And I think that's important to know. And it's not like one stage is necessarily better than the other. Of course, I think ideally the last stage, which I'll go over later, is the one you want to get to. But at the end of the day, these are kind of the stages that you'll, you might interact with or overlap with during grief and loss. And so with depression, you know, I felt that isolation. 
I was trying to cope with the loss of my mom to Huntington's disease, the loss of when she passed, the loss of my friend Jake, the loss of those childhood memories, the, the what ifs or like the loss, feeling depressed when feeling like I may not find, there may not be a treatment in time for me and I'll get sick. Will there be there? Will, will there be people there for me when I get sick? Will I live alone? These are all the things that kind of go in my head when I'm trying to grieve uh, during this whole process. And the last one is acceptance. So again, doesn't mean that you move past the grief and loss, just means that you have come to some type of acceptance uh, and understanding and what it means in your life now. So, you know, I did a lot of this reflecting with my, when my mom, you know, been, got sick and passed away. And I've, I've done a lot of that over the last year or so. And trying to accept that as, hey, this is okay to grieve about it. And this is okay to understand it. But again, it's not something that's just going to go away forever. And so with that being said, I just wanted to say thank you. And I appreciate you all just kind of listening a little bit to my story, a little bit about some of the challenges I faced, some of the resources that helped me along, you know, this grief and loss journey of mine per se, and then just hearing about my different experiences from those five stages of grief and loss. And so with that being said, I would love to open it up just for a conversation on how people are currently feeling, or if anyone has any specific questions that they want to ask. Thank you so much, Seth. Um, that was awesome. Um, yeah, I, I want to just bring to light, because I really love that you brought up how, um, like grief in different ways, like, so not just from death, but also diagnosis and also um, like all the different areas of that. Um, I do want to pick your brain a little bit. Um, I know you're shocked that I have want to pick your brain, um, but can you maybe, how, how was it for you communicating grief because I like that you also mentioned how like it's not all five stages right like it's not like in order and then you're done right like it comes back um is there a difference in how you communicate your grief now versus back when like your mom was first diagnosed yeah I think I was probably stuck in those first two stages for quite some time to be honest of like just trying to deal with with just processing that that whole thing um and not wanting to accept it i was like i'm not ever going to accept this like because why should i why should i have to deal with this when i'm just not i'm not using real names but if joey my friend joey or my buddy steve you know doesn't have to deal with it then why should i and you know that was tough that was tough for me to try to process all that especially and it, I think it's tougher today with social media, right? If I'm feeling, you know, I always feel like I'm being judged or I'm being, I'm, I'm being pressured by society of here. This is how you're supposed to live life. And, I, um, you know, I, what was tough was also grieving the parts of that, of what I knew I was going to miss out on. So, you know, mom, my mom passed away. And so not being able to, you know, if when I get married, right, having that mother son dance or, you know, her being able to be a grandmother or, you know, other memories that I now I'm seeing friends and their parents go through. And so that's tough. I think my grief now is just on tends to be now of and I don't even know if this is such a thing, but like a future grief of like what the future holds, especially with me with Huntington's disease of you know, showing symptoms one day, will I have a family? Will I, will my kids remember me, you know, if I have kids or will they remember me for only being sick? So that was a tough thing with my mom is most of my memories are when she was sick. And so those are just, I think, different ways now that I grieve is more, I feel like future grief that I'm anticipating, maybe anticipatory grief. I think that might be a thing. And yeah, and it's like, yep, it is. <laughs> yeah, that's <yeah>, a thing. <laughs> so anticipatory grief, I think, is more of what I do deal with now versus when my mom was first diagnosed. It was just like a lot of ang anger, 
um, denial, even just um, those what if statements. Um, I never got to that acceptance. And that's why I think it's so important to know. It's like, it's not, all right, you start with denial, right? I could, I went, I probably was more in like anger and then denial. And I was kept going back and forth. Um, and then probably even skipped bargaining and went straight to feeling kind of that depression. Didn't finally accept it until I think I started doing more research and advocating on understanding what, what this disease does and what's in my control. What can I do now that will help make a difference versus just kind of sitting around and just letting it define me versus me defining it. Also, Seth, we had a, a two questions come in the chat. The first one, I you might want me to answer. I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I mean, so the one thing I will say also is is to add to what Anna said was just kind of like taking that step back, taking a break. Like for me, I I, I mean, I'm still on my phone a lot, but I I try to refrain myself to being on social as much because of that whole mindset of comparing to others. Because I see all these especially on Instagram, like, I'm like, oh, these people are crushing life, like, they're crushing it, and then I compare myself to them, and then I feel terrible about myself, and I think that's a tough thing, versus I don't know what happened to them yesterday, I don't know what's going on behind the scenes, right, and I think that's the thing that helps me sometimes, it's like, hey, I just need a social media break here and there, um, but yes, regarding kind of the difference between a social worker and a therapist, the only thing I know is kind of the license that you get for being a therapist versus a social worker. But I know that there's also different types of therapists that you can see. Um, so I see, for example, cognitive behavioral therapist, also known as CBT therapist. Um, so sometimes I've seen a therapist who's given me homework, which sounds scary, but it actually get, makes me feel better that I'm like actually being productive. Um, but Anna, if you want to, you probably <laughs> know a lot more about the difference between the two. Yeah. So just a quick overview. So um, the major difference is a social worker can provide counseling. We do not provide therapy. Um, so our licensing is different. Um, the other big difference is that we more focus um, holistically. So we also, social workers also connect people to other resources. So like, for example, on my caseload, I don't just focus on the kiddos or the parents' emotional health. I also help connect them to um, if they're having issues paying for their gas bill or they're having issues getting food on the table. I connect them with those resources as well, whereas a therapist wouldn't do those things. Um, also, therapists can specialize. So um, cog cognitive behavioral therapy is a specialty. Um, there's different, there's different types of approaches and things like that. So um, therapists can be much more specialized and you can usually look for whether it's a certain issue you're wanting to have focused on or a certain method of therapy that you know might definitely work for you or might not work for you. Um, so that's kind of the biggest difference. Um, and then the other question that we have in the chat for you, Seth, is from the wonderful Anthony. Um, he said he wants to know if you think your experience experiences led you to help co-found our Odyssey since you personally struggled with finding social connection. I would say so. Uh, I think the the first person I actually ever met outside my immediate family, uh, who was a young adult, was before I went through testing my sophomore year in college, and this. Uh, there's a friend of mine at the time who lived down the hall and she's like, you gotta meet my, she's like, you gotta meet my friend. Her mom also has Huntington's disease. As soon as I met her, it's like, felt like I was normal again. And it's like, she just understood me. And then, you know, I got involved with a nonprofit in the Huntington's disease space called the Huntington's disease youth organization that does provide, uh, you know, peer to peer and professional support and education to Young, young people impacted by Huntington's disease under the age of 35. And so I saw what they were doing and I was like, wow, you know, an organization that's supporting Huntington's disease. And then, you know, later on, you know, as I started learning more about this larger kind of rare disease community, uh, you know, I met Anna, I met others and I was realizing that like, 
there wasn't enough like year round support for anyone, not just Huntington's disease, but just anyone living with a rare chronic condition. And yes, of course, there's some stuff that you, you might want to talk with someone that has the same condition, but there's other topics such as grief and loss, such as all the other topics we've had, you know, had these meetups about, or we will have a meetup on that is just a lot more relatable. And when you can relate, relate to someone that understands you, at least for me, I don't feel judged. And I think that's the, the most important thing for me is not feeling like I have to impress someone, not feel like I have to mm-hmm. again, be someone else. What a great answer. Not that I'm biased at all in any <laughs> shape or form. The organization, the person, it's fine. And um, I will just, I just wanted to throw out a, I don't know if it's the right link. It, eh, it might be, but it's through, um, it, for those that don't know, Once Upon a Gene, Effie Parks. Um, He's a rock star. Yeah, there's an episode actually called Rare Disease and Grief, and it's it's okay that you're not okay. Uh, so, you know, it's just the link. You can pro- you can find it, I think, on Spotify or Apple Podcast or, or whatnot. But that one was is, is a good one to listen to, at least for me. Um, that kind of, it, it's a reminder again of it's okay that you're not okay. Um, and Allison, not a, not a problem at all. Um, uh, you know, it's definitely, yeah, it's definitely a tough thing to, to grieve. Uh, a friend and so just know uh you know as as peers uh we are here for you all right everyone i know that we had another question in the chat but uh we're we're at time and the question that was asked was from anthony and so of course it would take more than three minutes to answer it so (laughs) um but i first just want to thank um you all for attending. Thank you so much um, for signing up and being here. Um, also, a huge thank you to Seth, um, not only for um, all his work with our Odyssey, but also for sharing this part of, um, of his story. Um, as all of you know, like that's really vulnerable to share. Grief is such a giant thing. And so the fact that Seth was willing and ready to t- tackle this for us um, really means a lot and we really appreciate it. Um, Make sure that you look us up. We've got more um, meetups already on our website that you can sign up for. Um, Please go check those out. Um, Seth also comes to our virtual meetup. So if you want to keep bothering him at another place, you can join us there. (laughs) Um, Thank you again so much, Seth. Do you have anything else you want to add before we close? I would just say, you know, again, don't hesitate to reach out. I think I know most of you here but you know find you find me on social or through our odyssey i'm happy to further connect again as a peer i'm not a uh i'm not a professional expert so i can't help on anything like that but you know if it's as a peer just trying to navigate life through grief and loss happy to see if if i can help with the brainstorming piece but thank you again for having me i appreciate it All right, everyone, that's going to be it. Thanks so much for coming. All right. Bye, Bye. everyone.